So hello and welcome to the RTS Feature Masterclass. My name is Bessa Khalifa. I'm a documentary maker, a writer, a director and a fashion stylist. Today I'll be the host for this session looking at the making of BBC's latest documentary, Leanne, Race, Pop and Power. I'm joined by the incredible team behind the film from Dragonfly TV, I've got executive producers Tom Curry and Sam Bickley, director Tash Scott, producer Candice Abiola and researcher Taylor Anderson. Thank you all so much for being here and taking your time to share your experience and expertise with us. Before we kick off, I just want to outline for our audience how the session will work. I'll be asking the panel lots of different questions. It's quite a full on panel. There's lots to get through. And then I'll invite you guys to submit questions via the Q&A function. So if you can see it on your screen, if there's anything you guys want to know or ask throughout, please put it in there. At the end, I will try my best to answer some of the questions. So we're going to start off at the very beginning. I definitely heard about this documentary before it came out. I think everyone did and everyone was like, what is this going to be about and what's going on? But I don't think anyone really knew what it was until we watched it. So I think, first of all, I want to ask Tash, because you are the director of this entire thing. How did this come, documentary come about and where did you get the idea from? So um, uh, for anyone who doesn't already know, uh, Leanne and I actually went to secondary school together and we've been really close friends ever since. And the idea for the documentary uh, really sprung from a series of conversations Lee and I had been having uh, a few years ago. She'd been starting to think more about unconscious bias, her identity as a black woman, uh, and her experiences within Little Mix and the rest of her uh, adult and her adult life and growing up. And we were having one of these conversations um, one night over dinner, and she was just like, we, we could make a documentary about this. Uh, and so uh, we started to talk about it a bit more um, and she wanted to speak to people that had a similar experience to her and different experiences to her so she could kind of better understand um, her own experience and figure out what she could do with the platform that she has to make some kind of difference and fight racism and um, so I then um, we, we talked about it we kind of worked something up and then I took this little kind of baby floating idea to uh, Dragonfly uh, because they're a company that had been very like, supportive of me throughout my career and then um, spoke to um, my mentor at BBC about it and uh, yeah that's where it all kind of started off. Amazing. As for, for anyone who actually has not seen the doc we are actually going to play the pre-titles. Tash has explained it beautifully but I think that will add to it by having a look at this little pre-title. Me right now, it's Leanne from Little Mix. They've sold over 45 million records worldwide. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome one of the most successful girl bands in the whole wide world. Nearly 10 years ago, my pop star dream became a reality. And since that moment, I've not stopped. I love it. I'm so grateful for this crazy roller coaster life. But sometimes, I felt I was being treated differently to my bandmates because of the colour of my skin. For so many years, people always look at us as less. Down, no matter what you go going through. It's something I wanted to speak about for a long time, but I didn't think anyone was listening. Why do I feel, like, invisible? And for so long, people would say to me, it's in your head. We have been in a bubble, I think. Now that's kind of like burst. I want to find out what I can do to fight the racism and prejudice I see around me. It is always predominantly white, always. To understand how the world discriminates against dark-skinned black women. If I was some shades darker, would I be sat here right now? and look at how my industry treats other black artists. They told me and said, we've got one black person, I can't, we can't have another. Taking the fight right to the top of the music business. I don't want it to just be a conversation. I don't want it to just be a black square. Some people aren't ready to this conversation. There's a problem, let's address it. Let's all address it together. Thank you so much for playing that. 
gives you goosebumps. I don't know. I get goosebumps watching it. I'm just like, oh, it feels like a lot of fire in that documentary. Well done, Tash. Um, we're going to move on to a section about development and commission. For anyone that doesn't know, I do have a documentary. Well, I did. I don't even know if it's on BBC Three anymore, but it was on BBC iPlayer. And a huge part of the learning curve of making a documentary is the development and the commission. For anyone that doesn't know, a commission is when you take it to a channel and the channel basically give you a green light. That's what a commission is. Um, the commission usually uh, is the executive producers that take it to the channel and they sort of pitch it and the channel say, we want this, you can change this, can you do this? But that's actually quite a lot of work. And I'm gonna pass it over to Tom. Tom, Tash came to you with this idea. She obviously had great access, which is amazing because access is a huge part of the commission and a personal relationship with Leanne. But how did you go about getting it commissioned by the BBC? Yeah, so it's sort of as Tash mentioned, we've got a really good relationship with Tash um, and she'd worked at Dragonfly on many, many projects as a director within a, a big team. And I also had a personal relationship with Tash. We worked together for the first time uh, on the first series of Hospital quite some time ago. So there was a, it felt like a sort of the perfect moment for Tash to kind of step up and sort of author her first film. And there is of course a really big difference between working as a director on a series and authoring your own uh, kind of film. And actually for this type of project, um, especially because of Tash with the access she had with Leanne, Tash herself was a kind of intrinsic part of the commission itself, basically. Mm. Um, and I think just, just quickly, it, it's really important for people that are sort of stepping out and, and wanting to make their first films to make sure they're doing it in the right environment with the right company, the right execs, the right commissioners, because it's quite, as Tash will probably talk about later, you know, it can be quite scare haunting. And for the first time, your head is kind of way more above the parapet than it would be if you were a director on a big kind of series with, with 10 PDs or the rest of it. So the, yeah. Tash came to us with the access and the idea. And basically, we worked with our um, development team and Taylor, um, who you're going to hear from a little bit later on, to work up the idea, basically, um, and to sort of find its feet and find its sort of shape of what it could be. Um, and when you're writing a treatment, what tends to happen is it's a quite, quite a back and forth with the BBC. So I think initially we had a conversation with the BBC, uh, knowing that this would be a really good home for, for the film on BBC Three. You know, they've got a really strong track record of, of you know, doing black and brown authored stories. And essentially the response from the BBC was don't take it anywhere else. You know, don't take it anywhere else. We really want this, which is a, a great starting point. It's not often that you walk into a room and that's the initial response. It's, you know, developing and getting stuff commissioned is really, really tricky. Um, but we felt really comfortable, Tash and Leanne felt really comfortable with BBC Three. So we felt it was a kind of a good home for the project. So essentially from that point, you spend a series of months working it up, writing the treatment. There's a kind of back and forth process with the BBC um, and then it will get eventually green lit. And it's worth mentioning the BBC commissioned this film before um, George Floyd's murder. So that obviously was a seismic moment for the, the world and it kind of galvanised Leanne even more within that journey. Um, but this was a film that was happening and we, you know, we were in pre-production for it. It was greenlit before that moment um, changed the sort of landscape of everything. And I think it's a really good thing to remember that often that you, you might go into it with a plan and have a treatment. You know, our treatment now bears... I don't know, maybe 40% relevance to what the finished film is. But it's a really good example that you have to go with your gut. And no matter how good your planning is, that you've always got to be kind of open to changing that um, yeah. and working on your feet as you sort of go along. And a change plan is often way, way better than what you thought it was going to be in the first place. Yeah, that's for sure. That's so true. Tom, for anyone who doesn't know, what is a treatment? Yeah, sorry, good point. So a treatment is a kind of document that lays out what the project is. So it'll sort of outline the editorial. Um, it will give a sort of idea of what the shape of it will be and how an episode will sort of arc itself. An arc is kind of how the story ebbs and flows throughout the film. So you get an idea of kind of the beginning, the middle and the end of what the story may be, basically. Mm -hmm. and what uh, the most important thing in those treatments is sort of getting a sense on paper of what you will see and hear as part of the film. So it's quite a detailed document. Treatments for Netflix can be sort of 25 pages long and feel like you're basically reading the programme 
and things for more <laughs> operational projects, you can kind of get away with that sense of, of, you know, these are things that could possibly happen, but this is generally the kind of tone and feel of what we want to be doing with it, basically. Amazing. Thanks for explaining that. So after you have done a treatment, after you've got a green lit, after everyone's like, go, 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 the next step is always setting up the production team. Such an important step because we talked about this actually when we had this call before, um, before coming online about how important that team is. Sam, this film is very much about racism and black identity, uh, but you have a white director who's making it. What did you think about that? And did you find that at all problematic? And how did Dragonfly and the BBC sort of handle those delicate topics? Yeah, really sort of um, important things to flag. Um, as Tom sort of said, Tash and Leanne um, have been sort of joined at the hip since they're at secondary school. So when you're making an access documentary, the best thing is someone who has intimate um, access and that your contributor, who's going to go on this very sort of deep, intimate journey, feels safe. So everything you're doing with your talent is in this instance and many documentaries is that you've got to create an environment where you feel safe, uh, where she feels safe. So that was really important and sort of non-negotiable. When I then spoke to Richard Bonds, the creative director at Dragonfly and Tom uh, about co-execing, uh, it was really important for me and it always is for me that I'm as a sort of senior woman in telly who's a, a woman of colour, I'm not going to be buttressed on top of a production and to make it diverse. That's something I always say and I always do. Uh, and, and knowing that this sort of personal authored film with Leanne was going to examine racism and colorism, it was also really important, as I said to those guys at the time, we need to have a black female producer collaborating with Tash and sitting in the driving seat of this film. And on that conversation, because um, they were ahead of the game, they'd already hired uh, Candy Saviola, who you see here, who I'd sort of known about for a long time. She's an incredibly accomplished and experienced producer. And when you're building a team, it's about the alchemy. So already then there's a, a great pairing. Um, and these two have been an amazing um, powerhouse. You know, they have yeah. sort of kept the film going, the values of the film going. Uh, they've supported uh, each other and they've supported Leanne. So that was mm -hmm. the right decision. Uh, and I think, um, as you say, sort of, you know, wrapping then around the whole production, because um, again, it's about diversity through the piece. Uh, Dragonfly also um, had uh, Taylor, who'd worked on the development uh, through production management, working with Louise Meridian, our amazing production coordinator. Uh, in the edit room, there was also a kind of um, a training program that was implemented that had uh, another candy to the sea. Um, working as a sort of trainee editor, and she's now now gone on to an amazing Netflix project at the back of this. Uh, and also our commissioners, you know, Max and Carl collaborating. So there's just been all these different eyes and perspectives yeah. been amazing on this, on this um, production at all times, all challenging each other, all bringing their own sort of perspectives. Um, I think in this sort of quite unprecedented year, a lot of us were also going through different things, sort of sometimes sharing our anxiety and pain um, that we we're all going through, um, examining this sort of subject at such a time. So you really did need a, a very inclusive team and it's just been sort of glorious. And I think the various perspectives are borne out in the film. You know, it's sort of Leanne's yeah. personal journey. Uh, it's her story. Um, it reflects the people that sort of um, reached out to her that she reached out to, but it's also got all the things that are really important to a very diverse team. And we all sort of made sure that, that, that those were plugged in there. Um, and just one other thing that I mentioned on that very first call with Richard and Tom is we talked about legacy because I saw so much mm. effort going into getting the right team to sort of wrap around uh, Leanne and Tash and to make this, this um, film happen. But what's going to happen next? And Dragonfly are an amazing company that have, you know, returning series like Ambulance, etc. And so it was really good to talk about that this same sort of process was going to be happening throughout, you know, sort of not just a knee-jerk reaction when it wasn't, but to make sure that that was being replicated uh, on other productions. Uh, and actually quite a lot of the team um, with offers to direct on ambulance, et cetera, are also working in development, working in production management, and they're still with Dragonfly. And for me, ultimately, it's that legacy. It wasn't just about this film. It was the building blocks that are going to continue after that, if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes total sense. Sam, do you feel like it's important for every team member to sort of know different parts of each department? I guess for the director should know what a producer does, a producer should know what a researcher does. Is it circular like that? 
I think that's why, you know, in, in television, being able to sort of go through all those different jobs is so important or to cover them. You know, by the time you sort of get to execing, you know, I've been a runner, I've been a researcher, I've been an AP, I've been a producer. You cover all those facets. So hopefully, I, mean, I know there's a lot of debate around sort of well-being in television, but really that's about you understanding what the other person's job is. Um, the thing about telly is you've got to get into telly to understand that. Uh, but I think it is really important that you, um, you know, there's got to be respect. You know, I don't know everything. Tom doesn't know everything. As execs, you know, Max and Carl, no one knows everything. You know, everyone's perspective on this film is really valid, you know, mm -hmm. but it's really important that people know what their job is so that the machine sort of operates. Uh, and I also think as an exec, you've got to support people also moving into other, other aspects of the job because that's how they grow. Yeah. You know, Taylor doing AP type stuff on this is going to help her grow into being an AP. You know, it's sort of, you know, uh, Tash and Candice are going to steal my job, you know, very, very soon. Um, it's really important that I'm, uh, you know, along with Tom, sharing sharing the secrets of program making. Sure. Yeah. But at the same time, listening to everybody so that I've got new things to learn uh, in yeah. the production that I take part in. Amazing. It's almost about being as open as you can be. Um, yeah. Candice. You were brought on to work alongside Tash. You're a very experienced producer. I kind of want to know from you, what appealed to you about this project? And actually, what was your, what's involved in being a producer on this kind of project? Um, well, what appealed to me firstly was the fact that it was a, a woman of colour making a documentary about race and colourism. That was kind of the highlight for me. I was like, finally, something like this is being made. And that was the, the pull for me. And, um, you know, to see that she wanted to kind of go on this journey for herself and kind of make a difference or just, you know, have something out there that she can be proud of. Um, and then, you know, in the project, you know, it was such a collaborative conversation with all of us, you know, with Taylor, the researcher, we're always talking about, you know, how we're going to get to X, Y, and Z. So, you know, as a producer, you're liaising with Tash and then the director and looking at the story arc and what we're going to film and where's Liang going to go on this journey. And I remember us in, in the office plotted it out of X, Y, and Z and like thinking, oh, we're going to go here and we're going to go to do, um, you know, film with the Carla or we're going to go to um, Jamaica. And that obviously didn't happen. <laughs> you know, at that time we were thinking of, um, you know, where we might go, where's Leanne's journey, what other things will people might to think of, or, you know, we had the researcher, uh, Taylor at the time, you know, thinking, researching of um, things that were, people were talking about online as, the narrative and Leanne's journey was actually happening so you know talking about colorism right let's go find an expert maybe to kind of find out a bit more where colorism comes from you know sure. um so we're find following the thread each time of where the journey was taken but that was naturally led by Leanne as well and her journey mm. so I would say amazing so just basically keeping your eyes open your options open um yeah. you're looking at the stories you're thinking ahead you're planning ahead as well um, mm. You're preempting, in a sense, what the viewer may think or say. So you're ahead of the curve um, with the conversation, whether that be um, following tweets um, of what people are saying, the negative aspects of Leanne's journey and um, from the black community as well as from everybody else within the music industry. Um, so you're, you're thinking ahead of how we would address that and how Leanne will feel about that um, and supporting Tash as well as well as Taylor on this journey as well as collaborative work. Amazing. Takes us perfectly on to Taylor, who we've not heard from yet. Taylor, you worked on this development, on this idea with Tash and with Candice. We want to know, you're the junior of the team, the youngest one on this screen right now. What is your journey into getting to TV and what was your experience working on this documentary? Um, so my route into TV, first a creative access intern. And if you don't create factors, they support represented groups and there's plenty of schemes out there and they, they do amazing things and give amazing opportunities. And this was one of them. Um, and I uh, primarily started in, in the development team. Um, and that's where I got to work with Tom and was invited to the very first meeting when Tash came along with the documentary. Um, and I was very much supported to sort of share my personal experience and my opinions on the debates um, surrounding the subject matter at the time. Um, and that was reflected when we were drafting treatments um, and I was brought along through the pitching process and when I got commissioned. Um, and by the time I was also brought onto the production, 
that's when the death of George Floyd had happened and there was a resurgence in the BLM movement. So as Tom said before, everything sort of shifted and the kind of theoretical that we were talking about met the practical. And then, you know, also as Candy said, the X, Y, Z of what we do next and where we go and what scenes we should show and what, what we should follow again changed. So um, I sort of got to follow that journey as well and see how the, the documentary adapted to the context that it was in. Um, and yeah, and then when I was on um, production as well, my sort of experience was basically learning the, the very basics of what you could do on a production because I had no experience beforehand. And so poor Candice and Tash um, had to endure my silly questions. Um, and when I was tripping over tripods and things, they were very, very patient with me. <laughs> so one thing I would say is, you know, even if you're very inexperienced, just keep asking questions, keep learning. Um, and it was very rare, but an amazing thing that I got to see the, the whole lifespan of a documentary. Um, yeah, that's very true. Incredible experience. And I have to say to Tash and Candice and Tom and Sam to sort of like take someone on and sort of be like real nurture you and build you up is, yeah, it's an amazing thing to be able to be part of. It was absolutely um, incredible as well, that's still. Yeah, <laughs> even though she tripped over time was, you were great. <laughs> <laughs> Taylor looked after all of us on this project. Yeah, there was no silly question. <laughs> well done, Taylor. Uh, so we're going to move on to filming. I have experience of filming a documentary and um, you go in with a treatment, as Tom says, and you go in with a plan and mood board and everything you can say in the steps you think you're going to take to get to the end of the project. But as what happened to my documentary and happens to most documentaries, it never goes the same way that it is on that piece of paper that you almost sold to the channel was happening. So Candice and Tash, I want to hear it from both of you. This film obviously was filmed during COVID of all things as well. What were the challenges for you guys both uh, when it came to filming? Candice, if you want to start first. Um, well, the first one's, you know, you never meet your team. So I hadn't met mm -hmm. Tash. I hadn't met Tom, Taylor or, you know, uh, Sam. So you hadn't met, I hadn't met the team. And then you're coming into a project, you're kind of on Zoom and working things out. And then the first day we go on to a sh shoot, you're like masked up and gloved up. And you're like, hi, we've got to make a documentary. And also I've got to be introduced to talent now, Leanne. And, you know, it's a bit of an alien um, workspace at first, but then mm -hmm. you got used to it. And the best thing about it though, was that we had so much time with um, Leanne. Um, mm. She's such a busy woman with her, you know, with her music career and everything else and all uh, the things that she does out, outside of the music. But to have that time with her to kind of see her grow and kind of delve into her story and her journey a bit more, it was a, it was a godsend really having COVID because she had downtime. So we mm. had all that time to annoy her and be in her house at every single point and be like, oh, your friends are coming around today. Can we film it? <laughs> <laughs> really embedded ourselves in Leanne's life that she by the end of it she was like are you still here <laughs> yeah oh my goodness you know as much as you know COVID was kind of a pain for us and we were always worried about restrictions of they kept on changing the guidelines so we were like how many people can we have in a house are we mm, like two meters apart course, yeah, yeah. Now, two meters apart from that person so you were always conscious of that but COVID in a sense we kind of worked around it each time and having the support of everybody in the team from Dragonfly and Sam and um, Tom and like BBC, they were kind of, you know, aware of what was going on and sure, yeah. brought us on this journey each time because it was ever changing. But, you know, we, yeah. we made it work and had phone calls in, in cars, separate cars all the time on Zoom. So, you know, we made it happen. We made- Lots of Zoom. <laughs> it's just a lot of Zoom calls, isn't it? It's just yeah. every, all our lives. <laughs> Tom, so, before we jump into you talking about one of the most important parts of it, which was the BLM protest. We're just gonna play a clip of the protest. Nobody has really wanted to speak about race in the pop bubble I've been living in. Uh, no, okay. I want to hear what others think I can do to actively help this fight. Um, so you guys know that I'm in Little Mix. How do you think I need to use my platform? You have to come and support. You need to be on the streets. Yeah. You need to be doing everything that you can. This isn't just about you. Yep. Education is key. Yep. You need to find that information. Yep. Don't wait for it to come to you. Uh -huh. You use the tools you have, yeah. the people around you, yeah. to, get, to read what you need to read, to watch what you need to watch, yeah. listen out what you need to listen to. Yeah, address colorism. There's racism, but colorism is a yeah. big thing as well. But you yeah. can't share anything 
that you don't understand. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, it's really yeah, important yeah. that yeah, you yeah, self-educate. Yeah. There are areas in England that don't have this many black people. Mm. And I'm sure there's a mixed race girl in that town who's looking at you thinking, mm. you know what, yeah. I want to know my history. Yeah. I want to yeah, know yeah, what yeah. Do you know what I mean? So just keep doing what you're doing because it you. means the most. So Tash, that was full on. You're in the middle, middle of a huge protest. Loads going on, lots of high energy, also loads of really heavy emotions. Can you tell us what challenges there were filming in that? Yeah, I mean, it was a real kind of baptism of fire being like, you know, that's one of the first uh, filming days and Candice wasn't yet part like on the project. And we did have another um, AP line here, Sadiq, who uh, gave me a hand that day. But yeah, it was, it was, um, I mean, we're acutely aware that this is going to be a really crucial scene in the film and in Leanne's journey. But it was also the very beginning and, you know, she, um, it was a very different kind of filming to anything that Leanne has done before. Leanne is very used to having a camera on her in her um, capacity as a member of Little Mix, but being filmed for a documentary does require a different kind of vulnerability and openness, um, which is different to being interviewed about um, your latest single. Um, uh, and it was it was an incredibly challenging environment, as you said. Like you know, uh, it was a very emotional day. I had to really strike the balance between getting what we needed for um, the scene to make it as impactful as we wanted to, but also allowing Leanne to have her space to kind of grieve and protest and encouraging her to feel comfortable in, in the new role that she was taking on mm -hmm. as the, the person who's leading this documentary. Yeah, I always, um, one of the bits I remember most about my documentary is when my director was like, go and talk to, go and talk to those people. Go, go, just go and have a conversation. And I was like, what do you mean? I'm just going to go talk to strangers? Like, I don't, I don't want to. <laughs> and the director's like, no, no, just go on. And you're like, okay, hi guys. <laughs> like, I just want to interrupt your entire emotional day and ask you what you think. So it was quite a challenge because as a director, you have to push. You have to almost push to sort of push her to sort of go beyond what she's maybe comfortable with. Was that hard because you're working with one of your closest friends to sort of push her? Yes, I think, I mean, there was, uh, so on, on the one hand, I mean, uh, I'm in no way complaining because, you know, having 17 years to build up your trust with the person who's a contributor in your documentary is never a bad thing, it's a real luxury. Um, but, uh, you know, you, you do also, you know, it's difficult to navigate somebody that you have an existing relationship with as your mate, um, to then be, yeah, kind of, as you said, pushing and sometimes be like, mm, you know, that, no, I need you to talk to more than one of these people because we do need to have some kind of person in edit. Um, and I think distinguishing our relationship between kind of friendship and director was um, was tricky at the beginning. Like the, one of those first filming days uh, when it was just Leanne and I, and I sort of um, uh, sat down and said, "Look, you know, we are. Um, I've got two hats on. I've got my friend hat, um, which we've all got on in the background. But when I'm carrying this camera, I am." director and sometimes I am going to ask you uh, difficult questions and I might take you to a dark place um, but you know everything I do is to make us the best film we possibly can and you know so that initial relate you know but yeah it does take a little bit of um, doing and then obviously once um, Candice came on and Taylor um, and Yam was able to kind of Form her own relationship with them, and they're both, you know, like and this especially is incredibly, incredibly experienced and brilliant producer who is able to um, work with people trust, like, you know, as soon as she walks through the door. <laughs> and mm. so that's like, very uh, good to be able to, you know, I think the producer director um, relationship is really important, and you, you, you need both of you. Um, like, one person can't do both of those jobs, um, and it's yeah. really understand and figure out what your working relationship is and that you know and there's so many times when you know uh, I've you know even though Leanne is one of my um uh, very, very close friends I'll be like and these uh, for you to ask these questions or like what do you you know like, like, how, like how should we play this day and um, yeah um yeah it's amazing because honestly what you're saying is there has to be such a level of trust I think um when you're dealing with the person who's in front of camera, there's a, such a vulnerability. I mean, I, I know firsthand of doing it behind and in front of camera, and there's definitely a trust, a huge, huge trust that you have to have with that person. 
And I've always felt with the director that I had, I needed her as much as she needed me. And I needed to trust her as much as she needed to trust me. So there is a, it's a camaraderie that you need to have. But then the director at the end of the day sort of has to be like, okay, well, what have I shot? What have I got? What can I work with here? And what do I need more? So there's almost a bigger head that maybe the person in front of camera doesn't even realize is happening. Candice, you had to, you had to engineer, Candice, a huge high profile talent get together with COVID restrictions all at the same time in the same room talking about the same thing I just want to how, how do you do it well everybody know that day we had a list at the beginning and it was completely different list to what we had now as well and firstly it was managing speaking to all the managers and all their agents and then getting them to buy into what we were doing and obviously speaking to all their artists and it was that first thing they came back and said, oh my gosh, they're all nervous. And I know they all want to talk about it, but you know, everybody's quite nervous. So, you know, you're having that conversation on, on and going, on going, on going. And then you have, um, we evaluate like, actually, have we got the right people? Um, you know, maybe we should look at other people as well and other artists. And, you know, you're always pursuing and then it's aligning people's diaries because obviously they're all artists and they're all busy. So aligning people's diaries and throwing out loads of dates and then finally getting it all to come together. And then we had days when people just started pulling out. Um, and oh yeah, that fun. That's yeah, fun. so they, they pulled out um, like the day before or on the day of. And I remember Tash ringing me and I was on the, in the office trying to sort this all out. Um, and Tash and Taylor on the shoot. And they're like, um, Candice, can you help them? One of them just pulled and I was like, who? They're like, they just texted and said they pulled. And I was like, oh, okay, one second. Okay, don't worry, I'll get on with it. So it's my I was on the phone, I was like, hi, Candice here. So, um, so let's talk through the Why did you come like, talk to dad, and then talk to somebody's sister, and then go back to the sister, and then go back to the dad, and then just allay the fears. Because again, it's a subject matter that, you know, women of colour talking about race on camera, it's never been done before. And um, they're all, we live in their tr own personal trauma. You know, it's a, also a trust issue for us as well. Cause they're like, well, what are you gonna do with it? How are you gonna portray us? And it's having that bond and that relationship with them as well at the same time, as well as their agents so that they all buy into it. And that room was the most amazing room. I think we all just left feeling like elevated, lifted and all went through the biggest therapy session. I mean, if they could all hug, they would have all hugged at the end, but instead they did air kisses and like air high fives. But it was one of those moments where they all were so, it was such a cathartic, cathartic moment for all of them and for us as well. And for Leanne that, you know, it was a shared experience and everybody had a safe space to speak about it. But it was um, when we got there, I mean, also I have to say Meridian, as well on the production coordinator who found us a location because you know that was big enough to house you know right. our director myself you know all the women in a safe space that was spread out enough for all of us to kind of social distance so you yeah. know everybody in the team paid a part in that and I remember me and Taylor going around on our bikes um going around different parts of locations to find find a location big enough to fit everybody in um so yeah it was all complete team effort as well when we when that all happened but Somehow we pulled Amazing. it off. I can't even imagine just being like, oh, it's the, it's the morning of, oh, you're not coming? Okay, okay, okay great. Okay, don't, don't worry about it. It's very stressful. Talent management is stressful, especially you have a high profile talent leading the story and then you want to get more high profile talent in the story. So it is, it's wrangling a lot, of, um, a lot of people and a lot of their teams to get them on board as well. We're just going to play the clip actually now that um, you managed to wrangle together. Well done, guys. So we'll just watch it. How do we play our part to change this? Like, sometimes you feel like you can't speak about these things. It's very British though. It, we're taught not to talk about it. It's like, it's something, it's, so, it's such yeah. a taboo subject. People are afraid to yeah. admit that they've done something that is considered racism. And you may not have meant it, okay? Like, I know there's not bad, there's not, there's not all bad in people. I really believe that we, everyone's got good in them. Like, um, I remember when, my mum used to take me to certain management companies. I won't name them now because they're, they're still friends and that's all good and it's all love. But when I was 15, they told me and said, we've got one black person, I can't, we can't have another. And that's, I got that a couple of times. And one thing that's like actually comes to my head right now is being told to bleach my skin. Oh, being yeah. told that I'm, I'm too dark to be in the industry. I'm going cold talking about it because I really actually don't like talking about it. 
you need to bleach your skin because you won't sell any records. That's what's so fucked up about this industry and that's what makes me feel at times where I go, I don't want to be in this industry. You know, they took my confidence away so much that I couldn't be me. Definitely cathartic isn't even, can't probably even cover how that felt to be in that room at that time. To move on, once you have all the content, you've been filming, 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 endlessly filming, endlessly trying to overshoot, undershoot all the things that you do when you're on set. Next stage is the edit. Um, I know very well that that edit process is a little bit grueling because you end up with about 50 to 60 to 70 hours of content that you have to get down to 48 to 50 minutes. So Tom and Sam, Tash and the, Tash and the team obviously went out, they got all the materials, the edit begins. For people in the audience who've never experienced an edit, can you briefly explain the process, sort of what's involved at the beginning, how does it work, the whole structure of it? And Tom, if you want to start. Well, Sam, did you want to start? Sam, go ahead. Well, not that we rehearsed anything or anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I mean, Tom talked about the treatments, you know, that sort of working document that sort of sits in, in you know, Carl and, and, and Max's hands, commissioners and, and the BBC sort of three sort of commissioners and uh, that Taylor would have had a hand in writing. Uh, that document starts to evolve and grow. So you've got the team, you've got Tash and Candice feeding in, what, what are we thinking of filming? What are we thinking of sort of shooting? Who are we thinking of casting? And that document starts to grow and turns into a shooting script, which becomes this hypothetical potential film that everyone's got in their hand before filming that day. So you get a sense of what's this scene about? What's the story that we're telling? And as Tom mm -hmm. says, Tash and Candy say, this often just blows up into nothing, but you still need to have something to lean on. And if you're lucky, that document keeps evolving uh, mm -hmm. till it turns into an edit script. So that when your editor's first yeah. day, if you're lucky, they've got the logs for the rushes that they need to be sort of selecting. They've got this edit script that's constantly evolving to give them an idea of sort of shape that's been born from the treatment to this moment. And they're sort of going into the edit with a bit of a pack. So that's sort of how the edit sort of first day starts. But it's really worth mentioning, and a, a, you know, this is very common, um, is that we were doing a lot of filming still as this edit began. Mm. Um, mm. that, that creates a kind of chasing your tail kind of scenario with an edit. Sure. You've got this idea sure. you want. You don't know what the ending's yet. You don't really know quite what the middle's doing. Um, so you're having to sort of set off on a journey, an editorial narrative that you're building, um, but you haven't captured everything yet. So that's mm. also really tough and certainly uh, reflects the, sort of the turnaround we had on this. Um, yeah. uh, so I'll, I'll let Tom pick up from there. Sam, just before Tom jumps in, two things that just in case the audience don't know, what is logging and what are rushes? Of course, well, well, rushes are, and it's quite an old term because it's, it's born of when things were filmed <laughs> and took ages to make. But it's it's the it's the it's what's being filmed, what's coming off of the sort of you know out the camera, and it's just the loose. Um, uh, God, it's, it's funny, I don't often to explain that, but rushes are just basically all the footage. Um, yeah, raw all, footage. Yeah, all the raw footage, all the A and B rolls, all the interviews, all the um, exterior shots. Um, it's worth pointing out all the, also, by the way, um, Tash is a very good shooter. I mean, um, mm. she had uh, uh, Ian Watts of one or two of the master interview moments, but that's something also really worth looking at with this film. There's some, mm. some really good filming. So her rushes were also good. Um, and there were, were a lot of rushes that we went into the edit with. <laughs> and Sam, just before Tom jumps in, logging, what is logging? Yeah, logging. So normally, if you're lucky, you've got someone on the shoot um, that's, as, as each take is taken, they're logging it, and they're often, often Taylor's log logging. Taylor. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and Taylor, awesome at that. And the really clever people on that shoot logging are also flagging what's the best take. So when you go into yeah. the edit, when they're doing their selects, they can see your notes, um, oh, you also yeah. have to note down things like capturing something called Atmos, where you're sort of just letting everyone be quiet and you're just capturing all that dead, dead noise. Atmosphere. That yeah. um, there's all sorts of things that have to go into that log uh, that are telling the sort of day to day story of what mm -hmm. happened on that filming day so that it can be captured, captured in a very organised way in the edit. Got you. Thanks for explaining that. Tom, tell me about the edit. Yeah, well, so as Sam touched on, we were very, very much still filming um, as the edit was in full swing. We actually scheduled four weeks of the edit um, uh, sort of in a period relatively near the beginning of the shoot, partly because of the editor's availability that we wanted to work with 
And also it gave us an opportunity to sort of get to grips with that early material, see how Leanne was coming across on camera. You know, Leanne is someone who's used to being on camera doing interviews and very much Leanne as the performer in Little Mix. Mm -hmm. And it was just able for Tash and us to be able to sort of sense check that, that we were seeing the real Leanne under the performer and the, the, the sort of human being that she is. And to get a sense of where the story we thought was going uh, and what the editor thought. And I think a big thing is that your editor is it needs to become your best friend. They come in, by the time you get into the edit, you uh, as a director can, sort of can be very snow blind because you've been right at the pointy end of the stick um, for you know weeks or months filming you know 12 hour days, hundreds of hours of footage. And your editor is the first line of defense at being able to um, have some quite tough conversations. And I'm sure mm. Tash will, um, will remember, you know, Shane and Olivia, you know, some things that we all thought were really great, them coming in with totally fresh eyes, they're sure. able to sort of focus down more on sort of what they think um, needs to be there. And, and they're the kind of first line of snowstorm defense. And then you've mm. got the execs and then the kind of commissioners um, uh, on top of that. And the collaborative nature of an edit is so, so important. It isn't the case um, that, that you just come in and say, oh, this is the film that I want to make. And this is what exactly put this word here. This is the sentence I want them to say. I then want a shot of that. It's such a working collaborative, collaboratively with your execs, with the editor, mm -hmm. especially um, throughout all of it. I say one of the most- Tom, Oh, go on, go on. Sorry to cut you off. Um, how long does an edit averagely take? would you say? Or how long did it take for this one? Well, that is an excellent question. <laughs> it mainly depends on, it mainly depends on budget and, and the sort of the tariff that the channel will pay for a program. There are some programs that are sort of low budget that can be cut in four weeks, uh, which is uh, pretty tricky to say the least. Um, an average time for an hour would be eight or nine weeks. Um, we had a few more weeks than that, um, partly because we had our editor training scheme running. And as part of that, we funded and the BBC funded a longer period for the, for the offline stage of the edit, which is the putting it together bit of it, to make sure that, that Candice with a C um, was able to get the sort of full uh, benefit from the training. So obviously that took a little bit longer. So I think we were, we were sort of more like 14 weeks on this. It's not uncommon for a single film to take 12 weeks in the edit. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Normally what happens is you have less time than you need. That's almost certainly the case with um, with everything really. Uh, yeah. but I was going to say knowing your yeah. material is the most vital thing and as a director going into that edit it's brilliant. Sometimes there are edit producer roles um, where a different person will come in and, and make the film but the benefit of having the director cutting their film is not only were they there and understand what the story is and where everything is, um, it's, it's a much better thing um, I think most of the time, certainly on a single film and having an edit producer. But yeah, mm. knowing your material, spending the time to watch it, interrogate it. And actually the other thing to say about edits is that there's a, a huge amount of time where you spend talking about it rather than with your hand on the keyboard for the editor and sort of, you know, doing the actual yeah. thing. And actually that, the conversations that you have are so important because otherwise you don't know, there's a million and one ways to cut a scene and you need to know, and, and you, the way the scene is cut will change over the kind of gestation of the film until it sort of is finished. But you need to go in there knowing what you want the scene to say and how it will kind of move that story forward and how each mm. individual component part pays into the bigger picture, basically. Can Amazing. I, can I just add, Buzz, ahead, that, that also, you know, the, the crucial bit about the edit is that, you know, you're also collaborating with the commissioners on the channel, you know, and having done sure. those jobs. Um, uh, you know, Max and Carl, uh, uh, Max Gofferty and Carl Callum at BBC Three were absolutely crucial. You know, they, was, they were sort of running mm -hmm. alongside the production because of the speed we were going, because of COVID, because of adding that mm -hmm. support that was needed. But actually what they do is they're always giving notes because they're the most mm -hmm. objective, subjective people that can be across um, that, that uh, the, what's happening in the edit. And so each time they're feeding in their notes, they're helping to refine and shape with, with you collaboratively. Um, what the film's going to turn into, um, and also the kind of film that, that the channel thinks will work for them as well. That's very much part of that process, and they did a, yeah, great job. a very good point. Very good point, Sam. Tash, oh it was your first edit as well. Oh, Candice, you wanted to say something? Bob in quick. 
um it was just to say also you, with candice um with the c i know it's really confusing we had two candices and very many songs um you know, <laughs> We, she cut also some four, four little films for Bite Size, BBC Bite Size. Mm. Um, Tash had like filmed so much footage, we made little mini stories on there as well. So Candy's part of that as well. She was able to cut those films. Amazing. Well Amazing. Gosh, Tash, she just kept shooting. Just yes. Kept shooting. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Great stuff. All good stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Tash, can you quickly tell me some of the top things you learned from your first edit? God, I mean, I'm going to try and be concise on this, but I could talk about this for a very, very long time because you just learn so much. I think there is, um, it is something that tends to happen in the, uh, you know, you might uh, do a bit of shooting as a researcher, a bit of shooting as an AP, then you become a director, but often your rushes, that raw footage goes off this magic band called the edit, and then uh, you don't see it again until it's, it's, some of it may end up on the telly. So um, actually being in the edit for the first time and seeing how those decisions were made and being part of how those decisions were made was so important. You know, you know, I was, you know, I had all the footage at home, so I was watching it during the filming process as well, which is so important to sit with your rushes and, and, and painfully watch them because you, you know, it's like watching, looking at pictures of yourself naked, you're like, oh God, why did I do that? Um, but, um, as Sam kind of alluded to, um, as a new director, you do often overshoot, like shoot too much um, of a scene because you don't really have the confidence yet to know know when you have, when you have it. And um, so, being in the edit and learning what uh, first of all hits the cutting room floor and your editor goes, I oh, didn't need didn't need you to film uh, that dog for thirty minutes, um, and also um, learning what your editor was maybe crying out for. So. Um, you know, oh, I know you have listening shots throughout the scene, but could you actually also just get some additional ones on the end, just so I, they're really easy to find for me. Um, that kind of stuff is really helpful. And um, if I could, like, the thing that um, I found like really helpful and that um, I learned uh, was something that uh, Tom and Sam really encouraged me to think about. Uh, it's just tracking um, throughout your film and throughout every scene of your film the story of, of the emotional. Um, and the learning of the emotional arc of the film, what is happening internally to your character, but also what is happening in the action of the scenes. And um, uh, each scene kind of needs to move um, both these things along. Um, so uh, it was, you know, like, you know, and, and, and it was really uh, useful and, I mean, imperative for me that I had not only two amazing editors um, and Candice, but also Tom and Sam and both the uh, of BBC to kind of like really guide me through that process because it is something you know it is it's a new world and I'm you know mm -hmm. like Tom and Sam were you know, incredible sitting with me with like with my script you know not, I'd not written a commentary script before and you know uh, having having people I think someone talked about earlier about having that right support but somebody who you know doesn't just tell you like well this is how you do it but like, this is why we do it that way and, mm -hmm. and, and learn from those experiences yeah, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of whys, isn't there? There's a lot of understanding of like why things happen. Sam pointed out something quite clever, like when um when the BBC or when the commissioner, whoever the commissioner may be, decides that they like something, and you're like, why do you like that? I remember in my own documentary, the commissioner was like, we really like the way you eat your toast, and I just thought, really? I just did this whole documentary, and you like the toast, and he's like, no, but think about it. The British audience eat toast. So actually it's a connector for people to be like, oh yeah, they, I'm eating toast, you're eating toast. And I just thought, I would have never, ever thought about that. So definitely more eyes on it and more different eyes from different spheres does make sense. I always think you have to, with the edit, as precious as you can be about your own edit, you also have to be open to being able to change the edit quite a lot. So we are close, but not too close to the end. Um, so we're gonna skip through to the audience questions. I think we have quite a few audience questions that we're just going to throw into the room and whoever wants to take it can take it. Uh, firstly, we have a question that says, being a young woman of colour at 18 who's entered the TV world, I have thousands of things I want to accomplish. How can I make the most of the opportunities in the industry? This probably could go to Taylor because she's making the most of these opportunities. So Taylor, how does someone make the most of these opportunities? Um... I would say that yeah just starting out I think um sort of even if you're you are the most inexperienced person in the room or on set um I think just 
sharing your opinions and sharing your ideas and keeping a collaborative um, conversation going, even if it's, it seems really scary, just keep doing that because you'll get, your experience will be so much richer hearing from those around you and mm. sort of get, getting, um, diving into their sort of wealth of knowledge and wealth of their experience. Um, mm. And sort of really see everyone as kind of like a, a almost like a resource, but a supportive resource almost. And yeah, um, yeah just, just keep talking, keep that conversation going and kind of get a, in a bar of steel. I've heard a few times, but it's actually true. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, that's quite interesting. Thank you, Taylor. Tash. Can you give us an example that editors took out or put in that differed from your initial plan? Oh, interesting. Um, I think, uh, I mean, it's difficult to know who exactly takes things out and puts them back in again, because they're, um, they are, uh, they're conversations that, you know, that happen, not just, you know, sort of myself as the editor, but then um, some common art um, commissioners as well. But um, there was definitely, I think, um, something that uh, I learned from um, the editors that I worked with is the idea that um, each scene can only do one thing, um, which is important to uh, remember. Um, you know, and what would often happen again with um, overshooting. And also, I mean, you have to give yourselves options in the edit. So you can't just kind of go, we're only going to talk to this one person about this one thing. But, um, uh, I would go to uh, the editor and say, like, well, in this conversation, we talked about um, uh, colours in the music industry, we talked about Leanne's charity, we talked about um, what it's like uh, growing up um, uh, in a predominantly white area. And so I think all these things should go into the scene. And um, they would go, well, no, that can't happen. You know, you have <laughs> like, to have a structure that, um, that uh, you know, a rambling conversation. Sure. And and, and that is um, that was something that I learned pretty early on, and was a really useful thing to remember going through as we constructed further scenes. Yeah, that's actually really good advice. That, um, a scene can only do one thing. It's pretty solid advice. Or only should do one thing. Candice. Just just to expand on that super quickly. It's one good example of doing it. When we were plotting out the lines and the big sort of story threads that were going to go through it, we had thought there'd be a really interesting uh, thread to weave in with Leanne and her niece and her sort of family aspect of how all that worked. And we filmed an entire set of scenes that would work with that. And in the end, in the edit, whilst they were all brilliant and absolutely could have been included, we felt, and the editors and the execs and everyone, felt that it needed to be sort of honed within its, within sort of her experience of music industry a bit more than it was. So that is a sort of just something to bear in mind. Good example. Yeah, very good example. Um, Candice, I, what would your advice be? Someone who might find themselves as an only black or brown person or a person of colour on a production team, how do you make sure that your voice is really heard and your perspective is representative in a positive way? Very good question. Um, and that's many times I've been the only person of colour in production companies as well as teams. But I think it's just having the confidence in yourself to speak up, um, to be heard, always send an email as well, because then it's noted as well. But um, know your know your research, and know your craft that gives that enables you more to speak up because you are you are knowledgeable and you have that information that kind of leads you into kind of speaking up a bit more and knowing that you have the source and information is mm. valid really. So once you know, I think that's the best thing is once you know the information, the resource and the research, you will, it will kind of help you speak up louder and be heard. But also move with a smile and keep your swagger because you're you and what makes you you is, you know, your ethnicity is one a part of it, but what makes you you is you. So just sell that. And that's, that's another thing that people will love is you as a person. Yeah, amazing. I love that. Just be you solid advice. Tom, the film ended in a really encouraging note with Leanne setting up her foundation. Is there scope or talk about following that up in the future? Well, a couple of the reviewers suggested a follow-up um, film, so I'm hoping that BBC Commissioning read the same reviews. <laughs> uh, that'd be great. Um, so, <laughs> no, yeah, we're, we're a bit early for those conversations. I think we're all still slightly in um, transmission week shell shock mode, but hopefully yeah. It's something that, you know, who knows whether I'm sure Leanne would be interested if she could 
fit it in and we would all certainly love to do it so uh yeah but a bit too early to see but, mm. uh, fingers crossed shall we say <laughs> um and last question is to sam sam what's your advice for someone who's an idea for a documentary but hasn't hasn't directed for tv before this lady or gentleman says i really want to make this film myself how do i get the idea in front of an exec or commissioner well i think um what Tash did, and I know Candice has done that, and, and what Tom and I did when we were sort of, you know, in the industry earlier days, is is getting get, getting someone someone's eyes on it. You know, just getting mm. someone who uh, you're working with. Um, look, I've got this idea. Would you mind having having a look at it? Because actually, that sort of filtering of your idea, you need someone to look at it to sort of go, look, can you sum this idea up in a few lines and to see the value in it? So having someone who can sort of discuss it with and sense check it with, I think is really, really helpful. Um, mm. But what I love about the younger generation is they're, they're also not as blocked by all the gates that are up, that mm. they're just getting out there and they're finding ways to make their podcasts and, that, and those podcasts are turning into programmes or they're turning into mm -hmm. comedies. And um, mm -hmm. they're making things on YouTube. Um, you know, someone with that sort of portfolio career like you have, Asma, for me, that that's becoming the sort of the way to work, and it's certainly something that I would have loved to have had available. So those gates yeah. get broken down. So on the one hand, I can answer what the process bit is in in gluggly gluggly telly, but actually mm. people are already busting through the gates anyway. Because um, mm. for me, it's about creative storytelling and creative confidence, and as Candy says, being your authentic self. So people, are younger people, are already finding ways to break through, and and telly will then also find you if you just get your story out there in some portal. Yeah, I think that's very good advice. Telly will find you. And in a way, gosh, I even think, yes, I'm a jack of all trades, but at the same time, if I was five years ago, you didn't have the options that you have now between right. YouTube, between Instagram, between Twitter, between all the Snapchats and TikTok, there's lots of ways of making content. I definitely think my advice to add on to yours would be that if the story is truly unique and truly your story, then hold on to it and push to make it because as well as no one else can make it my idea was I sat on it for they said no a few times I sat on it for a long time but I knew no one else was going to make it because right. it's my personal story yeah. so I think if you have an idea and you know that it's truly unique keep pushing eventually it might take a couple of years it might take a couple of months but it will it will prevail can I also add to that that it's also really smart in development to know when to park and pause ideas so you mm -hmm. keep generating more. Don't just hang on to that one and live and die by it. Have that one that you believe in and keep that traction, but also keep generating um, and, and listening to, therefore, if you're going to go the broadcaster path, just keep listening to what they're asking for as well. Yeah, I definitely agree. There's nothing worse than getting in front of a commissioner or an exec like you guys and being like, okay, great idea, but what's your next one? And you're like, oh, I don't, oh, I only, I'm just, I just have this one. <laughs> oh dear. So definitely have lots of different ideas. Um, thank you guys so much for this. I hope it's been a really insightful conversation. Before we finish off, I just wanted to go around in our group and give one piece of advice for anyone starting out on TV, wants to make a documentary, particularly documentaries on important social issues like this. What would be your advice? Maybe we can start with our youngest member, which is Taylor. Um, yeah, I would say, especially on a sort of social documentary um, or a documentary talking about social issues. Um, I, I mean, I sort of said it before, but um, yeah, don't be afraid to share your opinion about it. Um, because especially if you are just starting out, you're probably going to be a younger person with the kind of knowing the kind of trends of conversation that is happening at the time. Um, so, so yeah, just just keep sort of your know what the newest debates are about a, a specific subject that you're working on, um, and have the confidence to sort of push those push those forwards. Yeah, amazing. Thank you so much, Candice. What about you? I would say. Um on the basis of trust with your um, contributor so if it's a sensitive subject just gain their trust and um, kind of guide them through that journey um, because every step of the way it's going to change or they have may have wobbles so just have that confidence in trusting um, letting them trust you and kind of guide them on that journey. Amazing and Tash? Um, yeah I think um, yeah if you're just starting out on TV and you want to make documentaries I think uh, my piece of advice is and tell people what you want to do no like nobody around you nobody that you work with is a mind reader uh, if you don't shoot and you want to learn tell people if you work on shiny floor shows and you want to be an archive producer tell people that's what you want to do i mean the reason that i mean i was working in reality 
TV because that was the only place I could get a job. And I told everybody I wanted to make documentaries. And then the production coordinator went to go and work with Tom. And she remembered this and was like, oh, actually, you and then, then Tom interviewed me. And here we are. So, uh, yeah, I think just um, be kind of like loud and ask to learn. And um, yeah, that's my piece of advice. Amazing. And Tom. Yeah, I would say watch as much television as you can in whatever genre you think you might want to work in. There's many different types of that genre as you can and try and interrogate in your head why you liked it, or why you didn't think it was so good. And that will help. Amazing. And lastly, Sam. Um, yeah, I think, you know, um, whether you're, you're just into telly, you're trying to get into telly, whether you've been in telly a long time, I think for me, one of the important things for everybody in television but also if you're of colour and you're trying to bust through and you're trying to fight against some of the sort of systemic racism that can be within the creative industries is mentorship I just believe in the power of it um I can't currently partnered with creative access to sort of to do the training around with mentors who've signed up to the amazing programs they do um Taylor here was with, with creative access Meridian with part of the uh, production management team working with Louise was also part of a creative access I think look at someone who has the job that you'd love to do you know maybe even someone quite powerful who does the job that you like to do and get in touch with them and just say would you be interested even for a few months a few weeks at mentoring me it's one of the, the the most powerful ways I believe one of the most powerful weapons that we have that breaking through the gates of this industry um, and those people themselves uh, are also got still got a lot to learn just in the same way that I did on, on this production so it's going to be a reciprocal relationship um, so I think spot someone that you see research their shit and get in touch with them and, and cut jump over that gate and if you're already in you still need support and championship and development so I, I think that would be sort of my bit of advice for today amazing and if I can add to all of you guys I'd say for anyone watching my piece of advice for someone who made something is that it takes a long time and it takes a lot of knockbacks and it takes a lot of no's but had I made my documentary the first time I pitched it, it wouldn't be the same documentary as it was the fifth time I pitched it. And the documentary that it is the fifth time I pitched it is the best documentary it is. So definitely don't be disheartened with all the no's and don't be disheartened that it's taken a couple of years. I definitely agree with everyone in this room, and especially what Sam had said earlier is, you know, think of different things and do different things because eventually the idea will come together, but it, it's not an overnight success and it requires a lot of patience and it will help you learn who you are. If I would have started it, in year one, day one, I'm not the same person as when I shot it in year three. So take your time with it and it will happen. Thank you so much, you guys. Thank you for this amazing conversation. I hope everyone listening took a lot away from it. I hope you learned from it. I do think it's gonna be on YouTube for anyone who wants to catch up or share it. But to Tash, Sam, Candice, Tom and Taylor, thank you for sharing everything about the Leanne documentary, which you guys nailed. Um, we all loved it and um, I'm sure it's been a great success. Thank you. Thank you as well. Bye guys.